Welcome, everyone. I drew a card and said, what are you most grateful for? And I was telling my partner this conference because I love expanding beyond whatever it is that previously limited me. In my experience, that's fear. That's always the limiting factor. Love is the opposite. <coughs> so, by being here, I have expanded tremendously beyond my biases about business. Mm. Which were formed in many ways, but were so well expressed by Adam Smith in 1775 and by Karl Marx, Marx and Das Kapital. Mm. And in both of these works, it's very explicit and proudly stated that capitalism is exploitation. There's no two ways around it. Hmm. Now, this organization has combined that word with my favorite word, which is consciousness. <laughs> Conscious. Conscious capitalism. Hmm. In one way, it's an oxymoron. Can't exist. That's one way. What is that one way that makes it an oxymoron? It's a, it's a dead consciousness. It's a consciousness that you could say is dying. Mm. And from that consciousness, capitalism and consciousness, consciousness when it's meant as beneficent, as good, as love, mm. cannot be conjoined. But that consciousness is dead. That consciousness is still everywhere around us by force of inertia and momentum. But it's got nowhere to go now. It's failing. It's dying. <coughs> that consciousness confined us to the five senses. And it gave us our experience of power as manipulation and control. That was our good medicine. That consciousness and its replacement, a new consciousness, is what Linda and I came to discuss with you, what the differences are, and how it's affecting you, and how you are using it. And I'm assuming that you are using it because you're at this conference. Indeed. Now, I, I wanted to say something. Um, uh, we've been, I, I've been so moved to see how many of you uh, know about our work, have read The Seed of a Soul or other books that we've written, and it's just so beautiful. You've all warmly welcomed us into um, an area that we, you know, conscious capitalism, it, it, that's why we came, because Conscious capitalism, okay, <laughs> that sounds good. Let's see what that is. Let's find out about that. And we've been finding out more about it. Um, and it's just uh, so special for us to be here and see how um, such awakening is happening in each of you. Such changes are happening and the things that have happened in your lives that have created that. Because I know the things that have happened in my life that have created a shift in me. And I'm just so, so um, grateful to be here, to hear everyone and what you've spoken about and, and to speak with you on the breaks and um, just see your, hear your stories. And it's just so beautiful. And we're just really grateful to be able to share some of the things that we know. But I, I did want to say one thing because um, we always say this, that um, don't believe anything that we say. In fact, don't believe anything that anyone says. If they've written about it, or if they're on TV, or if they're anywhere, take it into yourself and see is it true for you. Experiment with it. See if it works for you. And if it doesn't, let it go. It's all good. And so that's, that's what we always um, want to share with you, um, first of all. Now, if you have a reaction to something that we're saying, 
if you're feeling resistance, that's also an area where you can like look, oh, I wonder why that's happening. I wonder what that has to do with me. I wonder if that really has to do with the people that are speaking or if it has to do with something inside of me. So you can look at it that way too, which is what I always do. I was thinking, um, sometimes people will say, I met this person, I saw this person, and I really didn't like them. And you know, just right away, I didn't like them. Like it was an intuitive thing. And then I asked them, well, where did you feel that in your body when that happened? Where did, where did you notice? And um, after they thought about it, they thought about, oh, well, they felt tightness in their heart. And they felt something in their solar plexus, just like abdominal area, didn't feel too good. And, I, and because they were people that were interested in what we were doing, we went a little further. And I said, well, um, it's possible that what you were feeling about that person doesn't have anything to do with them. It has only to do with you because you were feeling experiences of painful sensations or uncomfortable sensations in your body. And your body doesn't lie to you. It's always helping you to know if you are in a part of your personality that's based in fear or if you're in a part of your personality that's based in love. And so I asked them to let me know um, what it is about that person they didn't like. And as I began to describe it, um, I, because I had permission, um, I said, that's possible and likely that that has something to do with you and they're helping you to learn more about what's going on in you that you weren't aware of. Instead of pushing them away, you can learn about yourself. That's the most exciting work when I can learn about what is going on in me that's keeping me from giving my full gifts, from giving my love. And so that's just one thing that I, I don't know why it came, but I wanted to say that. Well, I think one of the reasons why it came is because it would stimulate some of you to be thinking, what has that got to do with business? Mm -hmm. What has touchy-feely stuff got to do at a business conference? Mm -hmm. Because I've got things to consider. Not only do I have to increase revenue, decrease expenses, not only do I have to capture more market share, not only do I have to compete with somebody who's just come out with a model that's better than what I've got, a product, what has what Linda just said got to do with any of that? Hmm. Everything. And everything that affects your ability to be in the world in a way that is effective. There are lots of ways to be in the world that are, were previously considered effective but are now counterproductive in every way. And that has to do with the replacement of an obsolete, dead consciousness that has been the defining characteristic of humanity for about 300 millennia or 2.5 million years if you want to go back to the origin of hominids, hominoids. That consciousness is the consciousness of the five senses, which means that the universe could not be more than that. And if it was, it was something you had to take on faith. And power is the ability to manipulate and to control. And that species that expressed that consciousness mm -hmm. evolved by surviving, and surviving required that kind of power. That's external power, power to manipulate and control the world. The new consciousness is very different. The new consciousness is about one human generation old, and already it's touched hundreds of millions of individuals, and we're some of them. Within another few generations, it'll touch all humans. And that new consciousness is expanding, expanded, always expanding beyond the limitations of the five senses. The five senses together form a single sensory system whose object of detection is physical reality. Now we have more, another sensory system. We are multi-sensory. What's a multi-sensory experience? There's lots of them. For example, have you ever had the hunch that you're more than a body and a mind? 
That's a multi-sensory experience. Have you ever had a thought that the world can teach you about you? That's a multi-sensory experience. Have you ever had the thought that the universe could be compassionate and wise and living, not inert? By the way, I wrote a book on quantum physics yeah. that won the American Book Award for Science. So I have exposure to that way of looking at the universe. Fortunately, none of the people who taught me anything about quantum mechanics, I believe, held that view of the universe. Mm. They were in awe of the universe. Mm. This new consciousness is a gift from the universe. You don't have to develop it. But it brings with it a new potential, lots of them. And the most significant to me is the understanding and experience of power as the ability, as the alignment of your personality with your soul. Soul, in this sense, you can look at it as Atman if you want. You can look at it as the part of you that is immortal, the part of you that existed before you were born and that will exist after you die. If you want to look at it in behavioral terms, it's the part of you whose intentions are harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. Becoming multi-sensory does not make you less angry, more kind, less aggressive, more joyful. It makes you more aware. Then the question becomes, what are you going to do with this new awareness? That's the question that we all have. Every time someone offends you, every time someone betrays you, every time someone is rude to you, mm. are you going to react from the old consciousness which is rigid, demanding, unyielding, and punitive? Or are you going to respond from the new consciousness, which is inclusive, accepting, mm. nurturing, loving? So we are in a position that no humans have ever been in before. Right. We are in a period of overlap. Mm. The old consciousness is being overlapped by the new consciousness, and the new consciousness is not taking 300,000 years to emerge. It's emerging with stunning, startling velocity, faster than an eye blink, faster than a heartbeat. It is truly a nonlinear event. And you can validate any of this in yourself. I just wrote a book called Universal Human. I think you will find it interesting because it has several chapters on commerce and on business. And I'll give you a spoiler. There is a new intention that is emerging in business. And I feel that for most of you that I've spoken with, mm -hmm. you already know these things. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most of you know all of these things. But still it can help, doesn't it, if you hear what it is you already know coming to you from yeah. someone else. It can validate that, that wisdom in you. That's what I told Fred when we came up here. It takes one to know one. Am I wise? No. But I can recognize wisdom when I hear it. So what is wisdom, given that? It's from the old consciousness that there is no connection between harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life, between humbleness, clarity, forgiveness, and love, and profit. No way. Put that on your resume and you're not working here. From the new consciousness, that's everything. The old consciousness was an intellectual endeavor. The intellect is designed to work with the five senses. It analyzes, deduces, deducts. Same way, deducts and produces advice to the personality about how to pursue external power. And that produces now only violence and destruction. And if you are following it, if you are pursuing external power, you're going to produce consequences that are destructive and painful. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean you go to hell. It doesn't mean you're rewarded if you don't do that. 
It just means you don't change if that's what you're doing now. Every action, every word has an intention. And an intention is the quality of consciousness that infuses the deed or the word. And if that intention is loving, oh, let me define some terms. What is fear? It's those parts of yourself that you experience as anger, jealousy, resentment, competitiveness, righteousness, vengeance, vengeance uh, superiority, inferiority. What is love? Those are the parts of yourself that you experience as gratitude, appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, awe of the universe. And you know where you can, do you, you know how you can know if they're there. I just I already spoke about it. You can tell by what's going on in your body, in your energy processing centers. Something in this, they used to call it chakras. And when we talk about that, when we talk about loving parts of the personality or fear-based parts, uh, we mean that if you are in a fear-based part of your personality that feels angry or upset or competitive or jealous or any, any number of things that come from fear that we don't always think of, stressed out, overwhelmed, depressed, talking about anything that's not love, you'll feel in your body as a physical sensation that will be painful or at least uncomfortable once you begin to listen to your body. You have to notice it. If you're in your head all the time, you won't feel anything in your body. But we can do a little, a little exercise maybe. Yes, well, I'd, I'd like to just lay out a little more groundwork. Sure. Because being in my head was my, my head, my intellect, my thoughts were my favorite refuge for 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's where the book on physics came from. That and my addiction to sex. All of them. These were, these were ways of obliterating what my awareness of what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I was always doing things that surprised me, but I thought they were cool. Um, and by the way, I'm telling you all of this, and Linda's sharing all of this, because throughout my life, I've always gone for the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I wasn't trained that way. I just want to go to the heart of the matter. When I was, uh, when I was at Harvard, I wanted to get into the Army. And it wasn't for patriotic reasons. I wanted to kill. And the Army would give me nobility for doing that. Mm -hmm. I was probably the only guy at Harvard that had f posters of paratroopers exiting a C-130 aircraft on the way down. And then when I got into the, when I got out of Harvard, mm -hmm. I immediately enlisted. I, I wanted to fly a fighter, but my, my vision wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So I decided to and go to the army. Now the heart of the matter in the army is the infantry. So I became an infantry officer because I found out being in the infantry, my mission was to close with and kill or capture the enemy. I didn't realize how that went directly to the heart of the military. Everybody's military, whatever branch, whatever job you have in it, that's the mission of the military. That was the heart of it. When I got out and I wrote the first book that I wrote about quantum physics, I wanted to go to the heart of it. That's what makes this book, it's called The Dancing Wooly Masters. That's what makes this book so simple, so easy to read, so fun. How can a book on quantum mechanics be fun? I wrote it for liberal arts majors like me that don't like science and cannot handle mathematics. It was my first gift to life. Since then, I look at the world that I'm living in, or I see around me. More and more, I'm not living in it. But I'm not, well, let me put it this way. When I look around me, so often I can see on the news brutality, mm -hmm. suffering, pain, loss, grief, destruction, never ending warfare whether it's between friends or between nations, between religions, between mm -hmm. cultures. I see genocide. I see 
cruelty that I just cannot imagine until I can begin to feel it. And then it's really horrible. It's really horrible. And I think, what can I do? What could I do? Well, I wasn't evolved enough to think I can form a nonprofit. I can help people in Africa get water. I can help people in the Sudan get food. I can, but that didn't satisfy me. It satisfies some people because that's their passion. Every one of us has a passion. Mine just happens to be this. For me, the heart of it all is consciousness. That's where it all comes from. So to change that, just like one of the presenters was saying, you can change them all. Why try to change this one and this one and this one and whack a bowl? Wow, that bowl was a uh, Mongol hordes going into Europe. Wow, that bowl is German troops flooding into France and Europe. Wow, that mole is Japanese troops flooding into China. Wow, that mole. There's so many moles, but they all have one origin, consciousness. All the love in the world, all the acceptance in the world, all the beneficence in the world, that also is a matter of consciousness. So, it's simply a matter of changing consciousness, but it gets more complex when I realize that the only place I can change consciousness is in me. Now, once you're multi-sensory, as you are becoming or are, you realize that you cannot change the world that is based on external power. Mm. External power is everywhere. It's the symbols are everywhere. Money, military, high offices in the corner. Uh, Who's got the coolest mountain bike? Who's got the longest dreadlocks? Who's got the most sexuality? Who's got the most money? Education. It's all external power. That's the world we've inherited from a five century humanity. You can't change that world with external power. That's what it's built. That's what it's built from, of, and with. I could spend six million dollars, if I had six million dollars, to put posters on freeways all across the country. Choose love. It won't work because I'm trying to manipulate the people who read that, those billboards. So I can only change the world by contributing something different to it. And you can only change a world based on external power with authentic power. The new power the alignment of your personality with your soul. So this is pretty much the foundation that I wanted to lay and to give you because Linda and I have been thinking a lot about how can we support you here. And I had to change my approach several times because first I thought, well, I'm going to share some of these things and, and it's just going to, put, it's going to put everybody off. And now that I've been here for a day and a half and I've spoken with a lot of you, I'm awed. I mean, what's, what, what's happening here is thrilling to me. You are thrilling to me. And so it's not a matter of being frightened that I'm going to put you all off. <laughs> My concern now is you already know everything that I'm going to say. I'm just using, I'm just articulating it in my way. Or at least you sense it, you feel it. Conscious capitalism in the new consciousness is not an oxymoron. It's a bold daring juxtaposition of two concepts that in the old consciousness would never meet. Hmm. How can you bring consciousness to business? Well, first of all, you have to ask yourself consciousness, consciousness of what? And I think that's what we're doing. And I'll, I'll wrap up this part for now, but I'll say that in my conversations with you, I've just been awed. And the variation of where each of you are is different, and your understandings are different. But there's one thing that doesn't seem to be different about any of you. You are all proactively, consciously striving 
in your domain of passion, which is commerce, to contribute good. Mm -hmm. And that thrills me. And that's why, as non-business people, we accepted the invitation to come to this conference. And I can't, I can tell you how good it's been. That's what I've been doing. It's altered my perception. It's altered my stereotypes. My stereotype of business before was a combination of Darth Vader, Monsanto, Bayer, and Nestle. <laughs> <laughs> There's none of that here. And. Um, so I thank you That's for good. that. What I know is that when I feel sensations in my body that are painful or uncomfortable and I have thoughts that are judgmental, uh, angry, whatever, I have a choice at that moment. And we, first of all, I, so I become aware of my emotions. I call that emotional awareness. Feel what's going on in my body. Then I do my best to make a responsible choice. And most people in the world do not know they have a choice about what they can do next. I can't stop an emotion from coming up in my body. If I have a reaction because someone cuts me off on the road or someone, or I'm feeling competitive or feeling jealous or whatever, I don't have a choice. That comes up in my body, in my thoughts. But I do have a choice about what I do about that. I do not have to act in that way. And so to create authentic power, you, what you do is you notice what's going on in your body and you um, make a responsible choice the best that you can. And sometimes it doesn't work that way um, where you go ahead and react in the way that you've always reacted, but that's not necessary uh, to do that. Um, but it takes a while to practice that. And maybe many of you are practicing things like that, but it's been my deepest practice since I read The Seed of the Soul, and Gary and I started working with each other together. I mean, not working with each other. We started being in a relationship with each other, a spiritual partnership, which is a partnership between equals for the purpose of growing spiritually. That is the reason for our relationship. That's why we're together. We're not together to try to survive together. We're here to really grow, and that's our new evolutionary path. Uh, to grow spiritually, so why not have people in your life that can support you with that? And so Gary has been um, my, he was my first spiritual partner, and, um, and then, but a spiritual partner isn't just a couple, it's anyone in your life. Our grandchildren are our spiritual partners, our, our, the people that are students of ours are our spiritual partners. We are in spiritual partnership with each other because Yes, we're having this wonderful transformation of consciousness that's unprecedented, and everything has changed, but it's not automatic that we're going to be creating with love, with authentic power. That's something that we choose. Every moment I get to choose whether if I have fear come up in me, I can blame it on someone else and try to change the world, or I can change myself and really change the world. Because from my changes, it changes everything. It changes the world in ways that you can't imagine, the ripple effect of it. Creating authentic power is our new evolutionary modality. It's required if you're going to evolve. It's not required if you don't evolve. And Linda has just taught you how to do it. It's that simple. It requires emotional awareness and responsible choice. A responsible choice is a choice that creates consequences for which you are willing to assume responsibility. Now comes implementation. And by the way, your life is proof of concept. Are you happy with it? Well, I can tell you, and I don't mean to be arrogant, but your life has a lot of pain in it. How do I know that so definitively? Because every human in the earth school has frightened and loving parts. Fear-based parts, love-based parts, the ones that I mentioned earlier. The fear-based parts are painful, painful, full of pain. 
And as you develop awareness in your life, the first thing that you begin to become aware of is what is mostly there. That's fear and that's pain. You can't develop awareness and just become aware of the love in you and the joy in you and the contentment in you and the appreciation in you. You become aware of everything. And now that puts you in a position to begin to choose. You can create a little gap, and sometimes a big gap, between the impulse and the action. Angry impulse, sexual impulse, and you're with someone who's also a sex addict. Uh, whatever the impulse is, turning your attention inward to what's happening in you rather than outward to what you think is causing what's happening in you, creates a little gap, and in that gap you can do the most important thing. Choose. Choose how you're going to respond. So that's, that's all there is. The only thing is... This, the, but, but now you have to do it if you decide you want to do it. There, there's just one little thing. The fear-based parts of your personality are very strong and they want their way. They don't want to do anything but what they want to do. So it takes sometimes every ounce of my will to make a different choice. And sometimes I don't make a different choice. And then it takes every ounce of my will not to make myself wrong about that and to come back to love, come back to what I want to do, come back to how I want to be in the world. And I, you know, I, I just feel like there's one thing, because we're in Austin, um, we went to see a friend of ours before we came to the conference. And when Gary was on the Oprah show, early on, there was a woman who came on the show, who uh, came on the show because she had read The Seed of His Soul and it had changed her life. And what she meant by that, I mean, this has literally changed her life because her um, only son, 20 years old. He was 20, yeah. He, he was um, uh, killed by someone, a, a young, another young um, man. And he was put in prison. And she uh, came on the show to explain what happened to her and how she changed her life. And so she told us that um, she wanted to not, after she read The Seed of the Soul, she didn't want to carry around what she'd been carrying around for all those years. And it's so amazing because we knew the district attorney in Austin at that time who heard her every day, she would call the prison and say, I want him killed, I want him executed. I do not want him in jail. I don't want him alive anymore. She said that for 14 years. She was so angry. She had that fearful part of her that wanted revenge for all that time. I didn't know about that when Gary was on the show. We didn't even know that story because we just happened to know this DA. And he told us the backstory after she'd been on the show. And it was an amazing thing because she they filmed her meeting with the prisoner who killed her son after she decided she did no longer wanted to carry this, did not want to have this fear that came up every day for her to want him dead. And we got to see her, um, see him in the prison, the one that killed her son. And it was so touching because she, um, she wanted to meet with him. She did not want to hold all that she'd been holding and all the anger and all the, re you know, the revenge and all of that. She, didn't, she wanted to let it go, but she knew she had to meet with him to do that. And so she did. She met with him, and it was such an amazing thing because they came together, and she had to say what she needed to say to him. She said, she said if you knew my son and you knew what he was like, you would have never done that. 
And she had her hands down like this. She was kind of, couldn't even look at him. It was just so hard for her. But she didn't want to hold anything from him. And then you could see he, he was came over like this. and just touched her a hand. And oh, it was so amazing because then he got to tell his story about his life and how difficult his life was. And she basically became his surrogate mother. I mean, after all that time of pursuing external power, wanted him dead, something else happened. And it was just an amazing, amazing story. And then she, she helped so many people, so many families of, uh, that were victims and uh, help them to see things in a different way. And she had um, the seed of the soul put in every prison in Texas, I know that, because that's where she lived. And um, it just, I just was so uh, amazed to be with the wife of the DA that told us the backstory about her anger for all that time. And um, I just like you had the signs up here that said the struggle is real, the story is real. The woman whose son was murdered was Thomas Ann Hines. She put the seat of the soul in every Texas prison. Yeah, we, we met her. We met her on, on the Oprah yeah. show. And the DA was Ronnie Earl, who was the DA of district, uh, the district attorney of Travis County um, for 32 years. And he was known for his passion for justice. For rather than justice and circumstances. His passion for justice rather than convictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and so we were with his, his wife. He passed on a little while ago. In fact, for those of you who live in Austin, we were with, right across... With uh, his wife, because Ronnie had passed on. But yeah, she now. didn't. Yeah. <laughs> we were with her. Ronnie passed on. And uh, for those of you who live in Austin, uh, right across the street from the county courthouse is a large new building called the Ronnie Earl Building. That's how much this man was loved. Uh, he, and for, for his the depth of the uh, experience, the depth of the influence that he had on the judiciary, law enforcement, nonprofits in Travis County. So authentic power is real. Yeah. Linda has just given you an example of how to create it in yourself. Thank you. Great to be with you. Bye. <laughs>